Welcome to the podcast of the lecture, which was, or of the presentation, which was given by me um, in the MEDI program in the last week of uh, semester one, 2014. Um, the last four weeks of the, semest of, of the semester are given in the MEDI program to work where we reflect on the concept of futures. And I ask myself, how am I going to structure this lecture in order to address the, um, the question of designing futures? And I thought to myself, what would designing futures mean? And I asked the students in class and in, uh, during the lecture, and they suggested that futures means um, where to from now? What will we be doing with all the stuff we have covered so far? And I thought that was a pretty reasonable uh, response. Um, I also have asked that question of Professor Ku, um, who was here, a visiting professor for about a week. She came here from uh, Kuala Lumpur, the uh, National University in Malaysia. And she came up with a very good response, which was, it, it's, it's not just um, about how we're going to design our futures, but what kinds of frameworks are we using in order to inform how we will be going about designing futures. So what she actually quite nicely did was to focus the discussion on what informs the design. What kinds of frameworks are we sitting on as opposed to simply on designing? And I thought that was pretty good. So what I'm going to do today is actually look at frameworks. Um, the kinds of, I will want to invite you to reflect on the kinds of frameworks you have explored and you haven't explored. It's still there in front of you, maybe in this MEDI program, maybe later on in your research work. Either way, what I would like to do is to create a dialogic exchange between us for us to, act, to reflect on the kinds of frameworks that inform the way we will be going about our jobs and designing futures. Um, what is it I want to say about myself? I am actually a teacher of literacy and language and, and, and second language, which means that the discourses I will be drawing on and the way I'll be working with them um, relate to my fields. I'm not really um, able to actually do it in science or some other subject areas. So that's just a disclaimer. I think that's just about it. Why is it that I call it believing is seeing? It's very interesting because um, when in class, when I was giving the presentation, I asked students um, in science, for example, or in academia, what comes first, believing or seeing? And our students, some of our students didn't dare to respond. It's very politically understood. <laughs> um, but some people did take a risk and, and thought that seeing comes first. So that's the kind of already question we could have um, in front of us. Is it seeing or believing? What is it that's the first thing that we have in mind? And then if it is seeing, then once we see, can we question what we see? So is our facts obvious? And if facts were obvious, if, if an object we see is an obvious thing, then why is it that we keep changing our minds? You know, the history of science, the history of medical research is a history of continuous change. So if facts in an act of seeing was unproblematic, why would we have this change? What are we seeing next day things differently? So it's very interesting. That's why I pose this um, question, believing is seeing or in, you can actually reflect for yourself which one comes first. So now when I actually, where, if I were to take this issue of believing as seeing or seeing as believing into next uh, issues that we have in our assignment, uh, in our uh, presentation here, um, we could actually see how we could work with this concept of believing and seeing. So what is pedagogy? Um, 
it's a process people said in in uh, during my presentation it is a process but what kind of process uh, typically in uh, when people think of education they think pedagogy is a set of activities maybe embedded in some rational uh, but it's just a set of activities and I'm thinking to myself well maybe not maybe not uh, it's a set of activities that what stick together because um, we invented the rationale that uh, justifies the way we stitch them together I don't know so I will give you in the next slide what I think pedagogy is it's a set of principles inherently oriented towards critical examination of the assumptions on which we act right so what I'm saying here is pedagogy is not looking for the rationale that will justify the way you stitch activities. It's actually pedagogy is a principles that are more like questions enabling you to open yourself to ways of thinking differently about what you do. So now pedagogy is no longer the answer, but it's a methodology for, for critically reflecting on what you're doing and it is ongoing it never changes you always have to reflect you always have to expand what you bring in into the pedagogic environment so that's very interesting because if we see pedagogy as inherently uh, as, as um, inherently critical or as a set of principles which force critical orientation towards your assumption assumptions then it would mean that seeing is problematic and believing that basically it's not we don't act on what we see we actually act on our assumptions on our beliefs and in that sense we, sh we are obliged to continuously um, inspect those beliefs and see how they relate together in order to actually uh, create a coherent whole so when it comes to those assumptions right those assumptions what I'm saying is inspecting these assumptions means inspecting the implications which they generate so we put different frameworks and different assumptions in dialogue and see which uh, kinds of assumptions together enable us to create the strongest the most enabling um, pedagogic environment now when I looked into research produced by um, Phil Cormack from uh, University of South Australia uh, they had a project where but where they examined um, the genealogy of the reading practice in Australian schools and they came up with this model knowledge method pupils so knowledge was I asked students uh, during my presentation many students and they said um, knowledge is like content then we invent the process so that we can actually transfer the content into students heads even the way I talk about it sounds already kind of a bit sarcastic right so I asked the students okay so is this the process is, is this sort of model the right model is this what they do how would when they see this model would they already know how to orient themselves how to assess it how to evaluate is it a correct model good model what makes it good so comments came up that the error goes on the one way and therefore it might be teacher centered or content centered uh, and I ask but so what it could be good a good thing how do you know it's not a good thing you see very often uh, what happens we get these uh, terms like teacher centered or, or um, the arrow not going both ways that seem to us um, that there might be something wrong with a model like this but we don't have a proper argument to actually defend it because because the idea that something is teacher centered in and of itself is not wrong we might 
be resisting it because we have read papers where people were talking about learner centered or something else centered. So we might be resisting the concept of a teacher centeredness, of teacher centeredness. But really, we need a more um, thorough argument uh, than just a gut feeling. And what I suggested to students was, hey, what, what is knowledge in itself? Where does it live? Can you touch it? And actually knowledge doesn't exist, content doesn't exist. There is no area of academia where everyone marches to the same beat of the same content. Had it been this way, we wouldn't need diversity. We wouldn't need many ideas. We wouldn't need controversy or subversion because we would all just agree then we wouldn't even need many universities. We'll just have one university that would be spreading content. Right? And that's not the case. So knowledge itself doesn't exist, which actually now allows us to put into question the idea of actually transferring content to students. What content? Whose content? OK, so you can see these funny symbols here. So I tried to actually bring a bit of semiotics or, or linguistics, however you want to call it into my presentation. And basically, if we think of S as a signifier, how do things mean? How do things mean, actually? That's the question that I posed. And why is it important? Because at the heart of every pedagogy, of every model like this one, is the question of how we construct meaning. What, what theory, what kinds of understanding underpins our belief, our pedagogic beliefs of how meaning is constructed? Is it truly coming from one to the rest through some sort of magical sequence of activities that are to uh, implant that content on st in, onto students' brains? Or, it's actually, or is it actually more complicated? And it is a very well-known fact that things don't mean they mean relationally. That's why I did these R's. They stand for relationships. So there is no one-to-one -one relationship between signifier and the signified. What there is is a signifier, and that signifier means things only because we attach relationships to it. And you can see in neuroscience, it's, it's obvious when you say a word, um, Marianne Wolf actually talks about it when you say a word. Um, the brain activates whole areas at the same time because there are potentials that you might be using in order to actually uh, work with this word. So things mean relationally, in relation to. So the table is not a table. It is not a chair, not a cup, not a vase, not a bench. You can see now. So we create meanings by actually relating things, by relating things in opposition to what the thing is not. And this is very interesting. So things are what they are not. You think about it a little bit. Anyway, I'll just leave this uh, lesson one in linguistics here because I think I've said enough. So you can see if things mean in relation to what they are not, you can quickly work out for yourself that the relationships through which people mean will depend on students' histories. Now that's very interesting because, because if those what things mean depends on students' personal, individual histories, then can you ever transfer knowledge into students' heads? Not Maybe you wouldn't even want to, but is it theoretically plausible? Because you never know what kinds of relationships students work with in order to signify. And in that sense, you really do not know what will make sense to anyone. Maybe you need to problematize not just the concept of knowledge, but also the concept of the method you use and also the outcome. What is it that you want? Students marching to one beat or actually working with knowledges, working with their, semiot their own semiotic systems, which they continuously reconstruct as a result of engagement. So as you can see, this model is quite problematic. Now, 
it's very interesting because very often when you teach literacy, you find this picture. And on this picture, students are shown what? That the teacher knows, the teacher knows exactly where she's going. They have one book, so there's a sequence of, um, some, of some kinds of activities that the teacher devised that are gonna do that are going that are going to create a kind of change or behavioral responses in students that the teacher is expecting. So what I'm challenging you here is to think about it whether this peaceful situation where the teacher is right in the center, there's a book, you we're all looking at the book and we're all quietly engaging with the teacher and all smiling, whether well, that's really a good thing. Um, I will show you what uh, Phil, Professor Cormack would say here. What he's actually saying that the model of teaching like this, where someone has a particular understanding of the knowledge they want to transfer, then they invent some sets of activities, and then they hope to see a behavioral response in children that they actually approve of, is actually a model where the teacher monitors in controls materials and ultimately controls the bodies of students. And what the teacher wants is as to see the outcome of his or her teaching to be revealed in particular behaviors of children, as opposed to um, supporting creative and critical uh, engagement in projects where it is not the behavior of the students, but we're going to look then at the richness that students brought in into their creative task. So you can see I'm already bringing in another dimension here, another methodology or another pedagogy of teaching so that uh, to contrast. So we have where the teachers monitors, control materials and expect uh, and control, ultimately control students' bodies by making expectations, by having expectations as to the kinds of reactions they want to induce in children. So that's one methodology, and the other one is a little bit more distributed, a little bit more um, enabling children more movement. I would just, I'm skipping a little bit fast today because this is all about just problematizing and making you think, not necessarily about actually teaching you the pedagogy. So. This is the model that actually Cormac uh, talks about, which is this um, 18th, 19th century models of teaching. And look at it, how it looked like. Student, it is, we often talk about teacher-centeredness, but actually it's not teacher-centeredness, it's actually book-centeredness. The teacher's role, the student, students do not um, look at the teacher, they look at the book. And the teacher's role is to ensure that they look at the book the way the teacher expects them to look, right? So poten potentially, potentially, potentially no different than this model. It may be that in schools there is room for a situation like this. I am not saying that nowhere teachers should be sitting with children like this. What I am saying is but very often, this kind of setup is seen as a core setup of a literacy classroom or some other type of a program. And you can see how problematic it is. And Phil Corm Professor Cormack actually illustrates it here, where you can see here the red thing is the book. The book, then uh, children sit around, children sit around those blue dots. Uh, so children sit around. Uh, they face the book and how they read the book gets transmitted through this um, through these yellow um, th these yellow uh, arrows show that children send to the teacher the message about how they read the book and the teacher tells them back again whether they actually read the book correctly or not so everything is actually uh, the, the, the ways in which they look at the book are monitored by the teacher. The teacher is actually the knower. And it's not about enabling reading, it's about ensuring that children read the way the teacher wants or the teacher approves. 
highly controlled, highly oppressive, in a sense, environment where there is only one way. So you can see that if that model is not necessarily the best model or the only model, and it's definitely ancient model, uh, what else? What is it that we would like? Maybe something more dispersed, something that actually does talk about creativity and diversity and creating many as opposed to just one kind of response. So we have here children working on the project. I pulled out this picture from um, Google Images, where people, where you can see a little bit different, a setup which is a little bit different. And what I looked at was the concept of project-based learning because we know that um, project-based learning could be um, one way to actually oppose uh, the more teacher-centered pedagogy that I have shown you before. Now, nothing is simple, really nothing is simple. So what I mean by this is I have actually identified um, on, through my search different models by which people actually describe project-based teaching or project-based learning. And I ask myself, if I were to ask questions of this model, what questions would I ask? So if we were to look at challenges, let's say that the challenge, the challenge is issued here, right? Uh, so if I were to look at this model, so let's start with a challenge. My question instantly is, who sets up the challenge? Where does it, where does it come from? Is it again from the teacher, from the content? How democratic is that? How does that actually engage the beliefs that children bring into the, into the classroom? It certainly engages the beliefs of the teacher because the teacher believes that they can set up a challenge for the students, but where is the student here? Well, it's not very clear, it's not drawn, the student is not drawn. So I'm not saying to you that this model doesn't account for students engaging in identifying their challenge. It's not clear from the drawing itself. Now the next stage, which is generate ideas, that's usually called concept mapping mapping the ideas. Well, let's sort of see how we're going to attack this challenge, right? Now, I have a problem with it because if we were to um, ask ourselves about the following. In your classroom, you have different kinds of students from different backgrounds. They bring different knowledges, different attitudes, and different emotional, what I call, set points. Not everybody is sitting in your classroom with a smile, ready to respond to every question you ask. Not everybody has tools to respond. Not everybody has um, the kind of um, things that teachers expect their students should be like. So when you ask children, let's create this conceptual map. Let's, let's, let's do something about this challenge. I ask myself, what if they can't generate ideas? What if they have no concept how to grapple the challenge? What will happen? Three students will dominate the class or one or two people. If you actually have a group work, one or two students will dominate. How are we working with differences here? How do we make different ways of seeing the world legitimized here? How do we make different dispositions of children legitimized here? See, so imagine if, if uh, at worst, if a challenge was um, was uh, um, or um, imposed by the teacher, and if that generate ideas was actually hijacked by two, three students who are most active in class and when we don't have a process for being inclusive in materials we use in the ways we work with children and in the ways children actually bring their knowledges into the challenge if we don't have an agreed process we might be actually not as inclusive as we claim to be with our words we might be excluding more than three quarter of the class then gather multiple perspectives on what questions the three 
the, the questions that were generated in the generate ideas by the three students who were active. See, there are problems with all of that. Um, the second thing I found on the internet was also project-based learning. And I think similar uh, challenges can be raised to this process. You can stop the video and you can actually have a look at it. What I'm challenging you is to ask yourselves how inclusive we are of other people's beliefs. And those beliefs form their framework, the frameworks that inform children's dispositions or students' dispositions, students' actions, student judgment of others and of themselves. So how inclusive are we? Not just of what we think, because that's easy, we're in charge. But how are we inclusive of others or even those who are even absent in our class? Do we, con if we have a classroom of, say, in Australia, of only Anglo-Saxon children, how inclusive are we of other uh, ways of thinking and being? So these are the sort of things that are on my mind and I want to share with you. So if I were to explain to you what I will be looking at today in our presentation, is exactly what should we do? What should be and why? Well, I think that in this, uh, so um, if I were to construct research or construct um, a, a concept of how I will deal with um, the issues of this presentation, I would say, well, I think that it is important to consider beliefs. I think also that in pedagogy, very often we uh, are not very considerate of beliefs others than our own. And we need to think of ways of how to actually manage this so that we actually are more considerate. Then what I would look also later on is strategies supporting exploration of beliefs. So basically I would be looking at strategies enabling that are inclusive and enhance students' uh, um, feeling that their perspectives are taken into account. I will be looking, because of my own also uh, interest in technology, I will be showing you how technology can be used uh, to do that. Um, because the difference that technology makes, it's not that it is more entertaining or we have games and we have iPads and all of that. I think the difference that technology makes is if well integrated into learning, it allows students to actually engage outside of the um, process of the classroom where typically uh, we're marching to one beat because that's just how the mechanics of the classroom look like. If we bring technology in a smart way, we're enabled to actually subvert the uh, goose marching process of the classroom and enable and, and open the room for individualization. So because I teach language, uh, second language, uh, se Lang uh, pedagogy of second language and also I teach literacy, I think we need to ask ourselves first what we think by these uh, terms. What is, uh, what, what does uh, learning of a second language mean or what does being literate mean or what is literacy? They're very important because then if we want to create a framework or if we want to engage frameworks in a dialogue to explore whether we're actually um, to explore how we think of the pedagogy of second language teaching or of literacy teaching, um, we are actually we, we can actually ensure that we ask questions which are relevant to that concept. So I will show you how I do it. Um, but yes, it's very important that we actually first begin with what we understand as second language teaching or what we understand as literacy teaching so that we then know what questions to pose. Because remember, pedagogy is about asking questions and then engaging framework to assess uh, uh, where we're going with those frameworks.
how consistent they are and how enabling they are. So we have many names, many names here. Uh, what in terms of um, the kinds of frameworks on which I base my concept of literacy or second language teaching. Uh, a lot of people actually are not aware of most of these names. So Saussure, so nobody knows who Ferdinand Saussure so was, was. It's a father of linguistics. Vygotsky, everybody knows who Vygotsky was. Bakhtin, nobody knew who, uh, in, class, in the class uh, who Bakhtin was. Um, and yet Bakhtin was a contemporary of Vygotsky and the current semiotics and especially French semiotics is totally based on Bakhtin. So he was not just another lecturer or another uh, author. He is essential. He was a key person to who laid foundations for then people like Bourdieu, Foucault, Derrida and so on. So uh, Latour. Uh, so Bakhtin is uh, very important. Mikhail Bakhtin contemporary of Vygotsky, but he fought differently than Vygotsky. And there is something about Vygotsky that appealed to the American market, and that's why Vygotsky is so well marketed, whereas Bakhtin is more a person known in Europe rather than outside of Europe. So we have Bakhtin, we have Piaget. Piaget um, is very interesting. There's a video on YouTube called Piaget on Piaget. You look for Piaget on Piaget part one. And Piaget that talks about how he got misunderstood by Anglo-Saxon authors. He says he never said anything. What the Anglo-Saxon translators were uh, actually saying he was saying. So that's very interesting. Paolo Freire, educationist, Dewey, Bourdieu, sociologist, Foucault, critical thinker uh, and historian, Derrida, God knows, semioticians, critical thinker, and Friedman is a um, um, teacher of French at the University of Melbourne, but she's actually, Professor Friedman is actually a semiotician, cognitive scientist, Minsky, Guberina was um, a phonetician, teaching deaf people uh, here. Latour is a sociologist, uh, Professor Latour, very famous. Complexity theory, you have heard from Gary Fry. Anthony uh, Damasio is a neuroscientist and another person, neuroscientist. You can, these are the kinds of people that, if I were to sit down and write out a list of people that had an impact on me, um, I would also mention here um, Andrew Peter Lyon, Professor Andrew Peter Lyon. He's, um, he's been a professor for the last 20 some years, um, currently in Asia, in Thailand and also in uh, Vietnam. But he was a professor in Australia, Bond University, Canberra University, Rice University and in Illinois. So quite a good past and he's a language teacher and technology person. So the reason why I mention all these people to you is because what they share, all of these people except for Vygotsky, and you will see that I'm not a lover of Vygotsky, what they share actually is the idea that belief precedes seeing very well made argument by Foucault when he analyzes medicine and he shows how different beliefs were uh, informing how we looked at disease. So, you know, in the 15th century, something might have been which caused um, thing and today it's just the flu. So nice analysis. Another thing is Derrida, Derrida Jacques Derrida, he said this beautiful sentence, which today you can test using computer saying that the difference which establishes phonemes and lets them be heard remains in and of itself inaudible. Isn't it interesting? We think that there is a difference between one letter and another letter, that there is a difference. But in fact, he says that the difference in and of itself is inaudible. It is only through relationships through the process of relationship building, we actually start attributing differences. So this is no different than the other concept I showed you about signifier being meaningful only through relationships of contrast. But in itself, a thing does not have any meaning. 
So these relationships of contrast we construct by saying the thing is what it isn't that actually attributes meaning. Things don't mean in and of themselves. So all these people basically would agree, would agree with um, this statement. That's what they actually share together. And it's very interesting for language teaching, of course, and for literacy, because what we do, we teach meaning. And the question is, how do you do it? These things don't mean in and of themselves, but they do mean through contrast. So it instantly tells you what you should be facilitating. It's explorations of contrast. Right, so we move on here. Now, what I will want you to look at is actually this statement here, which is very often in uh, literacy or language teaching, people say, you've got to know your learner, you've got to know your students, you have to know your students. Well, what I will do is actually invite you to look at um, some questions and see for yourselves how well you know your students. Because what I want to show you th is that maybe knowing your students is not the question to ask. Because the question, because if I actually start probing you how well you know them, you will find out that actually it's quite a challenge. But before I move on there, um, for some reason I have put in this graph here, so I might just explain it to you. I don't know why I put it in this place, not somewhere else. But if you remember the other graph where everybody was looking at the text and the teacher was uh, mentoring students, this is a model produced and published by me, which is the alternative to this 19th century uh, uh, model, where actually you can see that students examine texts in order to produce a text for it to be then given to other people. To, so basically, in a nutshell, we could talk about it that students look at the world in order to engage with the world. So they examine, they examine relationships in texts according to the particular purpose that they have in mind, either to create a text or create a project. And the text they create is not for themselves, but, but to actually share with others. So you can see in this model, students actually are in the world, exploring the world in order to act on the world. So, they, so the texts on the left indicate students exploring the world and the colorful icons, the, the, um, the circles on the right, symbolize the world on which they act. So on the left, what we have on the left side of the screen, students explore the world and on the right in order to impact on the world. So you can see that the student is in and within the world. Let's have a look now um, at those questions that enable us to actually uh, think whether we know our students. So if we were to actually ask ourselves questions in a context of literacy or maybe science, whatever is of your interest. But for me, uh, is, um, I'm looking at language teaching and literacy. What is the student doing actually in the context of literacy? What does the student do? Students do what? If we were to think about it, what does the student do? when learning a language students do what learn a language well that's that doesn't take a uh, master students to actually say that students do what uh, uh, learn vocabulary well that's that's just quite limiting learn structures of language is it what they do what does that mean right you need to you need to unravel it what does that mean so what do students do now how do you know that so this is when you actually start drawing on frameworks and say, what framework can I look at that will help me to answer this? Well, I would look at um, people who believe in content. So students learn the content of language. Well, yeah, 
if you want to, but language lives in people's heads, really. It doesn't live in a textbook. But you could say that. So if you said that, that students learn the structures of language, of a language, you can see these arrows I have put here. Now, what I want you to do is to think for yourselves how you would answer all these other questions and then examine what will come out come out so what kind of story you will create in the process of trying to answer these questions and drawing on particular frameworks of your choice so when we actually take a framework and answer this question take a framework to answer this question take a framework to answer this question when we then look at it as a story what will come out so I have created this thing this is what I say we could actually take this rather than use my term we will create this one okay so students learn the structures of the language what are the global challenges what will be the global challenges of the, 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 of the context in which students are doing? And challenges to assessment, you might actually want to answer yourselves. But at this very moment, I'm going to leave these two. I'll just create a story. So in a traditional setting, students are seen to learn the structures of the language in the classroom. When? When responding to teachers' questions or demands. What do they want? To get a yes from the teacher? Why? To what end? to please the teacher, you know, we do the task that the teacher invented for us and we'll do it in the way that the teacher will give us a tick and the teacher knows what's the best and how are we doing this? Through imitations, through, uh, through activities and behaviors that seek teacher's approval. Now, when we actually create the story using the monitor model, remember the monitor model we looked in the beginning at it, monitor model, as a framework. It looks awful, doesn't it? It just looks really prescriptive. The student is not here. The beliefs of students, how are they integrated? Right? So the question was whose beliefs um, our pedagogies actually help us integrate. And in that sense, how inclusive are our teaching pedagogies? So when we look at this, at the framework of a monitor model and ask ourselves, what futures are we creating using this model when we actually start looking at these questions? It looks, in my view, pretty grim and archaic. Now, so I suggested something else here, just very simple question answers. So if we were to think that we are multisensory beings, right? We have many senses and these senses, we activate them in different ways, those sensory systems in order to actually respond uh, in a, in a way that actually ensures we got things right. So what is the student doing? Mobilizing the various multisensory system for the best outcome or impact? They do. They do mobilize multisensory systems in order to actually respond. Where? Uh, well, it depends the context on the context of the engagement. It could be community as small as a classroom or as bigger as a school or bigger say around the school or it could be they're doing websites and they're actually putting things online and, and actually want to engage international communities right we're going outside of our little teacher student um, box when do they do this mobilization of various systems when grappling with the demands they perceive when working with a specific task, when working with the demands they perceive. So that's the key here, because it's not with the demands the teacher tells them, but the demands they perceive. So that's very interesting, because then the teacher's role changes. It's to facilitate perceptions, not to give them tasks. Right? It's not to give them a drill. If you do that, you'll be a better person. It's actually to put uh, conditions in place or tools in place that enable children to expand the way 
they look at things. So the purpose is to evaluate the, how they are doing, to evaluate the frames of reference or understandings on which they act, why to predict the potential impact, where, where is it going to take me, if I respond in this way, will I actually get somewhere? And how by evaluating assumptions and thus changing the, okay, so it's, this is about evaluation and expansion. How do they do it? By evaluating and by changing perspectives from which they look at their own responses. If a teacher enables students to have access to tools that allow them to look at themselves differently, what will happen? They will look at their own perceptions differently and the demands which they perceive will change. So this is, might be something new for you, I don't know, but what you straight away can see, and it really doesn't matter whether I'm right or wrong, but what it does say, you can see that the frameworks of the authors I have shown you before make me say different things than you saw here. And you can see that in this, these answers, I am bringing the student in and I'm legitimizing students' perceptions. And what I'm saying is that teachers should not be actually canceling them out, but what they should be doing is enabling children to work with their perceptions for the best impact. Now, uh, in challenges, I have put these things here. You can actually think for yourself what they mean. I don't want to spend too much time on it in this video. And why to what end? To ultimately know oneself, right? The more you know yourself, the more expansive frameworks you have to actually understand yourself, the more actually, uh, um, the, the better engaged you are the, uh, in, the, in, in the community, in the world. So the more, the, the more informed your actions are, the greater chance you have to actually act uh, in a way that assures a better outcome of the outcome that you actually intended, intended, because ignorance is not a good thing. So this is the model I use. I think that students should be engaged in projects. There should be support created for students uh, in, in the form of activities and, and tools, enabling students to actually explore their beliefs. The support you can actually divide into different aspects, what, when, why, and how. I have published a paper in the online, in the Asia Call online journal. Um, so you can find the journal on the asiacall.org website. Uh, and that explains it some more. And just to finish off, I just wanted to show you uh, the difference between critical pedagogy and non-critical pedagogy. In a critical pedagogy, which is the model on the left, the research and, and teachers do not act directly on students by thinking that if we do this method, a good thing will come out. What happens is that the research and teachers enable children to interact with the target language context. And what they do, they put in place support systems, activities and tools. And often these tools are actually what I will be showing you are, are technology based in order to actually interrupt the way how students look at themselves and look at the target language speakers in order to when they when this interruption is created students then change the way they look at themselves so the idea is for research and for teachers to create activities and support students with tools that enable them to look at themselves and others in a way which is no longer familiar because if we always look with in, in, in a familiar way, we don't expand. But if researchers and teachers enable us to look at things differently, then we can ask ourselves questions, what else is in there that I haven't seen? And the process of expansion and ultimate transformation of uh, the terms on which we act begins. And this is the old model where researcher knows the student and the student then uses the models that the teacher makes them, makes available for them and then acts on some sort of uh, materials or in some kind of contrived task-based teaching context. 
because everything is controlled by the research by the researcher or by the teacher right the the the, the context of students interactions are controlled and the tools that students have or are given to work in a particular environment are controlled by the teacher there is no actually criticism uh, in, integrated in this uh, model on the right because the researcher is the knower or the teacher is the knower this is good for you this is how you this is how we see the thing today and this is how you should be doing the things whereas on the left the, the researcher or the teacher doesn't know how to do it. what they do is well ultimately you've got to function in the world so what we will do we we'll give you tools that enable to, you to look differently at yourself and at others it's it and the research continuously reflects of how to actually produce increasingly informed tools and activities so that children can, and students can actually have richer environments now there are particular things um, that i have been engaged in to uh, facilitate this form of learning i will not have time to discuss all of them but you can find them on my video channel on youtube if you look at the YouTube channel called Anya.Lion.Dia, if you go there, you find a lot of, uh, so that's my YouTube channel. You will find a lot of videos. This particular one will be called Avatar, and you will learn how empowering a free system like text to speech can be for anyone, for children starting at the, at the age of five to adult learning, all of this. So there are particular ways that the other, that this little software, text to speech, empowers students to explore the understandings they bring into the community context. Another one is speech to text. People speak, and the that the, uh, the, the the system actually um, shows them what they said. And of course, it's not perfect. And that makes it even more fun and possible to actually explore different relationships. Again, it is about exploring relationships of contrast. Both systems are actually facilitating. So you can um, see through my videos how to use it. Here's a, a system that Andrew Lyon and myself, Lyon and Lyon, have actually described in many publications and actually created. So you can see now that there's a video file and there's a text that this boy is, or, or, or the, the text of this video file, and it's here in STARS. Students are given opportunities to actually, this, this is a listening comprehension uh, exercise, whereby students can actually identify which bits they want to listen to of a particular file so they can stop and start at any place whatever whichever uh place on this picture on whichever stars they select the video will play those stars um if they can't there's an answer evaluation somewhere here like guess right so what what is what is this person uh saying there's a answer evaluation built into it so the person can actually select a particular uh, words in this program and they can play it and they can write what they think they heard and the evaluate answer evaluation system will actually tell the student whether they got it right or wrong and where they got it right where they got it wrong and might even give them hints to actually make some corrections so there's a number of things that students can do they can play the text slow fast normal there are also ways of playing the text in a way that kind of distorts the regular um, speech but it distorts it in a, in a specifically designed way to accentuate other things in language that typically people don't hear and in a nutshell what it does it allows students to hear language in an unfamiliar way an unfamiliar way means they will perceive things they normally don't hear and that's the actually objective of this so there uh, this is the language lab sort of thing so the student play video there are chunks the student can play the chunk then can the pl play the chunk in a forward building manner which means I go to school forward building manner is I I go 
I go to, I go to school. And the backward manner would be, um, here, backward build-up would be school, to school, go to school, I go to school. So that different ways of hearing allow students to actually perceive intonation patterns they wouldn't hear otherwise. And they can record their voice and compare with the original. Then this is a cultural database where we actually draw students' attention to what you say in different contexts and why you say it. And also gestuality. You see how this man is holding his hands and so on. Um, in different cultures, people sit in particular ways. Uh, some ways are uh, acceptable, some gestures are acceptable, it's very interesting to interrogate it. Here's a dialogue generator where actually by clicking of the button you can have a dialogue, say it could, this one is at the travel agent, by clicking of the button generate here, it's on the bottom, uh, so it's um, hold dialogue and so on, your dialogue and generate dialogue, you get, by clicking on generate you get another one and another one and another one and all of them at the travel agent so it's a like kind of bigger than a textbook because you can have a million of dialogues in that at the travel agent or at the butcher or at the something so it's a kind of uh, funny thing and you can record your voice and hear yourself in a dialogue i don't investigate myself second life but it does enable you if you play in it to actually change your role and therefore Start see start building awarenesses how you would be if you were a man or how you would be if you were in a different country how you would be so you there is more to of course technology than just these things but what I wanted you to see and draw your attention is to things other than Facebook things other than social media you can see that there is a lot of resources out there whether they are free resources or resources we created ourselves that enable you to empower students by actually enabling the students to look at their own production, their own guesses, their own understanding of how they work with language um, in more than one way. More than one way, not just by memorizing dialogues, not just by um, creating a thing, but also explore their own understandings with which they work and therefore change their mind and therefore learn, of course, because when we change our mind, we have learned something. So I will finish for now. Sorry for taking so much time, but um, I hope that the lecture or the podcast today has enabled you to actually start thinking about the frameworks that if we are to go into the future, we need to think what, are, what frameworks we are sitting on, what frameworks inform the way we actually want to go forward. And I think the most interesting thing in this lecture was actually have some questions here on the left and produce your answers and then you actually justify who is actually telling you all these answers and maybe compare with some other ones and then actually critically examine which frameworks are actually more enabling the students and enabling you and which frameworks are actually more like a closure and look more like a 19th century model as opposed to 23rd century model. And so there, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I hope you had a great time in your MEDI program.